John chapter number four. Lord, I'm so excited about preaching this. I'm so excited about preaching this. I'm telling you. This is my third message in the John four. And I don't know. I thought each one of them I really liked. I'm not sure which one of them I enjoy the most. But um, let me give you a little bit uh, while you're turning there. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. You know that. And I dealt with the fact that Jesus came was sitting at the well, and this woman came. This woman was Samaritan, Jesus a Jew. The Samaritans didn't have anything to do with the Jews. No, the Jews didn't anything to do with the Samaritans. A lot of it went back to a day we read about in the Old Testament where that started. And then after Jesus meets her, He begins to talk to her about water. Then I preach about that living water and how we can have that living water. That water is a picture of what God puts in our life. I'm glad one day when I was thirsty, I'm glad that God gave me living water. Well, now we come to John 4, verse 25. And in John chapter 4 and verse number 25, we run across something a little different. The Bible says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, He will tell us all things. Isn't it interesting that even as a wicked life she was living, she still heard that Jesus was coming. Jesus saith unto her, I speak unto thee, I that speak unto thee am He. If you read this in the original Greek, it's interesting because in the original Greek it seems to say, I am. Amen. And upon this came His disciples and marveled that He talked with a woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? Now, I've always wondered about this word marveled here. It had nothing to do with my message, but I want to give you this thought. When you read about this word marveled in the Word of God, I've always thought the disciples probably saw him talking to a Samaritan woman. So because of that, they probably were like, what in the world is he doing talking to her? But the word marvel doesn't care that idea. The word marvel carries the idea with wonder or amazement. Other words, they must have been thinking, man, what kind of Savior do we have that He would even talk to sinners like that? Amen. And notice they didn't say anything about it. I think they knew that time when to keep their mouth closed, right? Amen. Jesus loves everybody. Can I get a witness on that? The Bible says, what seekest thou? They didn't say, what seekest thou? Why talkest thou with her? The woman, here's my phrase I want to use. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and noticed this, and said to the men. You'll find sometimes the Bible uses words man or men, talk about all human race. This talking men here is talking about in the masculine. Why did she go back and talk to the men? Because every all those men knew how she was living. All right? And she said, come see a man, which told me all things that ever I did. It's not this to Christ. Then they went out of the city and came into him, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed and said, Master, eat. Remember, that's where they were gone. That's where they were gone while he was talking to her. They were gone to McDonald's. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him all to eat? They were, they want the Lord to have some to eat. Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Wouldn't it be great if all of us, our number one desire in our life was not about ourselves, but it was about doing the work God called us to do. Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I send you, lift your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. I want to stop right there. And I want to preach and give you a little bit of the symbolicness here of where the Bible says that she left her water pot behind. I want to preach this morning with the help of the Lord on this thought, leaving the water pot behind. Leaving the water pot behind. What is the significance? What is symbolic about her leaving that water pot behind? Keep in your Bible. We'll do verse by verse as I preach on this thought. Let's bow together and pray. (coughs) (coughs) Heavenly Father, thank you so much. God, for the privilege of reading this great, great chapter. For three weeks, Lord, we've read about your grace and mercy. And now, Lord, we're going to see grace and mercy take a trip and share with others. Lord, I pray that every single one of us, God may leave our water pot and may go and do what you want us to do. 
Lord, have your will and way, and I'll thank you so much for all you do, and we'll give you the glory, and we'll give you the praise, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. you can be seated. I want to just ask a little simple question here. We'll go back, and we'll look at the verse in the Bible that I read, and that verse said, in verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men. I want you to understand when she came that day, let's don't spiritualize scripture, make it any more uh, than it really is. When she came that day, she came that day in the middle of the day, about one o'clock, the hottest part of the day in that region of the world. And the reason that she came but in the middle of the day, as I stated to you last couple of weeks, is because she was ashamed of who she was. Everybody knew who she was. She uh, uh, had, uh, had five husbands, the one she's living with now is not her husband. She's living in adultery, living in sin. Let me just add this. I still believe it's sin today to live together and not be married I don't believe that's right I believe the Bible makes that very clear that it is not don't call it love call it sin that's what it is if you love somebody and praise God marry them say amen but anyway I want you to understand this I want you to understand that in the middle of the day she came because simply she needed water to take care of her thirst that was that simple Let's don't spiritualize it. Let's don't try to make it any more than it was. She was thirsty and she came to draw water. Now listen, you've got to understand, God would not have put this in the Bible, would not have given this to us, unless He wanted us to understand uh, there is some symbolic message here. There is something to say, how do I know that? Because when she gets there and meets the Lord, uh, He begins to talk to her about water that you can't get out of the well of Sychar. He begins to talk to her about water that you can't find anywhere else. He said, I want to talk to you about living water. So you see, there's a whole symbolic part of all of it. The fact is that he came. The fact is that he met her at the well. The fact is is that he was there. And the fact is that she left her water pot behind. Let me give you what's symbolic about it. I want to give you some reasons why I believe that she would have left her water pot behind. Number one, and I believe this, I believe she left that water pot behind because she's saying to us, I have found living water. I believe that. I believe with all my heart the reason she left that well, the reason she left that water pot, the reason she left there is she wanted people to know that I have found living water. And she had living water inside of her. I also want you to know this. I want you to know I believe another reason she left the water pot is this. She's got to go tell somebody. Got to go tell somebody. And can I tell you this? If you ever get living water, if you have an encounter with Christ, if you ever get saved, if you ever get born again, friend, listen, you'll want to go tell somebody. You'll want to go let them know. You'll want to go say, hey, I was thirsty and I was parched and I had no joy and I had no peace. And then Jesus gave me living water and I want to go share it with you. I think it's real interesting. Can you imagine who she shared it with, Brother Justin? She shared it with men. I'm going to tell you why that's interesting. If anybody would have known what kind of change in her life had taken place, it would have been those men back there where she was from. Can you imagine when she comes back? And I guarantee when she comes back, they see her walking up. Maybe some of them said, oh, here she comes, you know. Uh, they may have said, oh, she's one of them kind of girls and, and this, that, and the other. And I won't I use a phraseology I could use in mixed company. But here she comes like that. And she lived the life of a harlot. She comes. Can you see them say, hey, hey, which one of y'all going to try to uh, get her to come to your you, you can imagine what they must have been thinking when she came back to them. But I want you to watch this. Can you imagine? She gets there and she looks at them and she said, come see a man. Yeah, amen. She gets there to them. She says, buddy, what you need is not me. What you need is not me. She basically is saying, Brother Dermont, I have found what I've been looking for and I want you to come see a man. I want you to come. You know how I know that that meant something to her? Because they went. You get this? It must have been so powerful. It must have been so powerful in her life. It must have been so strong in the change that God had made in her life that she went back and told people that knew her. 
You know why people tell me all the time, oh, it's so hard to go talk to people that knew me before I got saved because they knew what I was. I got news for you. That ought to be easy for you because when you go back and talk to them, that's one thing they're going to notice right off the bat. They're going to notice that you're not the same. They're going to notice that you're different. They're going to notice that God has changed your life. Amen. Amen. Marquis, I was looking up there in the choir. And they were singing that song. While I was looking up there in the choir, I saw your hand up there and you're praising God and tears in the eyes. And I was thinking in my heart, I remember when you first came here, it wasn't like that. I remember you didn't used to be a shirt and tie sitting on the front row. I remember it didn't used to be a heart for God like that. But you know what? I, he don't have to give me a bumper sticker. He don't have to give me a license plate. He don't have to wear a t-shirt. Honey, if you've been with Jesus, somebody will know you've been with Jesus and they'll know who you are. And I want to say this today. Hey, she found what she was looking for and she said, I must tell somebody. Amen. 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 But I want you to know something else. I believe another reason, and I think this is the most symbolic part of this chapter. I believe the reason she left her water pot, I believe the reason she left the water pot, don't you listen, is she saying, I'm leaving the old life behind. Now she does come back and get to, you'll, you'll study your Bible, she needs a water pot, got to drink water. But that day, anything attached to her old life did not matter. That day, anything attached to her life did not matter. You know what I wonder sometimes? I wonder sometimes we leave the water pots. If we leave some stuff in our life that really doesn't matter. If we leave some stuff behind that really doesn't matter. If we would in our life decide, you know what? There's something better in him than there is the water pots of this world. There's something better. Somebody help me. There's something better in him than there is in the water pots of the world. And see it. Friend, can I tell you this? This world will not satisfy. This world will not change your life. Friend, I don't care how much money you have, what kind of job you have, how much prestige you have. I don't care how much dope you smoke, how much beer you drink. Friend, it will not satisfy you. There is only one thing, and that is a drink from heaven. It will change your life. It will satisfy you. And then you'll want to go tell somebody. Right, Y'all have heard me tell the story, but for those new to Calvary, I remember right after I got saved, hadn't been saved long, and uh, I had a nickname growing up, Brother Russell, he still calls me this name. I probably got my name in his phone, it's Purple Haze. Now I won't tell you why I have my name, but you know, Haze is my last name, but if you didn't grow up in my era, you probably wouldn't understand Purple Haze, and God bless you, I'm glad you don't. But anyway, could play a guitar, never mind. But anyway, I want you to understand this. I haven't been saved long. I'm talking about leaving the water pot. And I remember going to a Hardy's in Elon College. And I went to the Hardy's in Elon College. And at that time, if you went to a Hardy's in Elon College, you would always take a razor, maybe a change of clothes. That's how long it took to get your food. But I'll never forget, I'd go into that Hardy's, and I'm standing in line in that Hardy's, and all of a sudden, since I got saved, and it's been a while, since I got saved, Alex, I had never heard anybody call me this since I got saved. And I heard in Hardy's, hey, Purple Haze. And I hadn't met Brother Russell yet, so I knew it wasn't him. <laughs> and it was two dudes I went to high school with. They knew the way I lived, knew what I was. Oh, I went to church, but buddy, when I wasn't in church, I was a hellion just like the rest of them. Right in the middle of heart, it's hey, purple haze. I walked up there. How y'all, man? You know, just you know, you got to stand. I say, save me half years. I ain't, I ain't been out of been in long. But you got to remember, I got called a priest one week after I got saved. One week. So we're standing in the Hardy's, and boys getting ready to order the food, and they they, they asked me. I mean, you got to look. They said, purple haze, what you doing now? I said, man, you ain't gonna believe it. What? I said. A few weeks ago, I got saved. Oh. And I said, a week later, God called me to preach. I thought they were going to pray. <laughs> they kind of looked down, looked up at me. And you know how they, oh, that's great. You know, they're saying that great, but they don't really, they have no idea. They're just saying that's great. 
I'll never forget it. Them boys got so messed up, I don't even think they ordered their breakfast. I honestly don't even remember them getting it. I remember standing there, and all of a sudden, I was by myself. And you know what they were thinking? How in the world can somebody we used to party with and do all this with, how in the world could God call him to preach and God save him? Friend, I'm going to tell you this. He changed my life. I left the water pot behind. Let's go over and shoot pool. Be around Bud Dumber and Miller Low Life after we got done what we was doing. I don't have to do that anymore. Amen. I left that water pot behind. Amen. Huh? Amen. I, I used to have language come out of my mouth, and God forbid some of them still in there if I got mad enough, so I had to be careful. Don't you look at me like that. But anyway, you don't slam your car and finger in the door and say, Hallelujah, praise Jesus. Amen. But anyway, I'll never forget uh, how I used to want to do that. Listen, and then God sent me to Virginia to Bible college. Worst Bible college, pathetic, liberal garbage. But he sent me there. Not for the school. But one day coming across the parking lot was this hot baby. She looked at me and immediately fell in love. <laughs> then one day she said, will you marry me? I said, take a number. <laughs> she wasn't the kind of girl I used to want to hang around. Because she read her Bible every day, prayed. Did all that stuff, you know. But guess what? Didn't go back better. <laughs> guess what? Started. I left my water pot behind. Amen. See, God called me to preach. God told me. And I didn't know what kind of preacher I was going to be. I didn't know I was going to be one of these, you know, hard nosed, fundamental, nail it to the wall, Baptist preacher. I didn't know what I was going to be, but God already, God knew. Amen. And God knew it was going to take a special woman to deal with all that. And God put besides my salvation the greatest thing God ever put in my life besides being saved. Now, I love my daughter. She's, she's great. It's a, you know, we say it's a different love, and it really is for your kids. But my wife is the greatest gift God gave me apart from being saved. She's been, listen, I'm telling you, I hate to say this because y'all can look at me like, Lord, have mercy. We don't want to pass like that. But a whole lot of times, she's the strength of our family. I know man's supposed to lead it, and I do lead it. I mean, I tell her what to do, and she says, ain't a good idea, let's do this. <laughs> Amen. But I want you to understand, sometimes she, why? Because, see, I could have got the wrong, and I hate to use a girl's water pot, but I could have got the wrong water pot, or at least crack pot. I could have done that. Am I preaching Right? How many of you, listen, young men, my soul, let me say this to every one of you. You boys called to preach, you that are. Uh, let me say it to all of you. If you want God to use your life and you want God to do something with your life, it may not be you're going to be a preacher. It may not be you're going to be a youth pastor. But I'm telling you this, you better pray and seek God. You better ask God for who God wants in your life. And you better ask God to help you in your walk with the Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't want to embarrass them by talking about them, but I occasionally love to look when I'm on Facebook at Brother Harry and Miss Lori talking about this is my sweetheart. I love her. She loves me. And they've been doing that as long as I've been his pastor. This gets on my nerves. I mean, just this love, love, love that I'll see on there, you know. And you know what? I think probably, and I'll tell you, somebody ever spoke in a marriage thing, Brother Harry and Miss Lori, marriage, I'm telling you, I've seen it with them and even Justin and Natalie. It's just been kind of, it's different. I mean, it's just, you can tell, you can tell that that man, you know, that person's it. You know, you can just tell that. I mean, I know that. I, you know, he was my associate pastor for a long time. Pat, he's here in members of his church now. You can tell that. Amen. You know what? But I bet if you would ask him or her in their lost condition, if you'd ask them who they could have ended up with lost, who, what direction they could have went lost, boy, what a mess that could have been. And I'm telling you, you better wait and know the will of God in your life. Amen. Let me move on from that, but I do believe that. I believe that. Now, I want to show you something in the 
just five minutes or so I have left here, and, and I like to get my buses going, and the reason why I were. I've, I saw some in this chapter. I'll be honest, I've been preaching this Bible a long time. I preached this chapter a long time. I want you to look in your Bible just a minute. Go back with me. Let's just uh, go past where the disciples want to know if the Lord's got something to eat. And let's look at verse 35. Say not ye there yet four months and then come the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields so they water in the harvest. I want you to watch this. <coughs> I want you to notice that the woman gets, and can I say this, saved at the well. I believe she trusted Christ at the well. I believe it's a perfect symbolic of what she did. She went back changed. Comes to these men. Who's she coming to? Samaritans. And said, come and see a man. Come see a man. Isn't it great if the story is Christ? Now I want you to watch. So the Bible said, they started coming. Read your Bible. Now, when they came, some of them came because of her word. Others trusted Christ later on in that chapter because they listened to him and said, man, this man. But I want you to watch. Watch. We've used that verse, the fields are white into the harvest. You ever thought about, what did Jesus look at when he said that? Some people say, well, he must have been looking out over some kind of cotton or some kind of white. Well, probably not in that area. But what was he looking at? Let me tell you what he's looking at. I believe when the disciples were standing there, coming over the hill was a group of men. They would have been in white robes because they would have been Samaritans. They would have had robes on. It was probably midday, been really hot, so they'd wore white. What Jesus said, watch this, a Jew to Jewish disciples. Over that hill comes all the people that woman had told about Christ. And he said, behold, the fields are white unto the harvest. Amen. You know what he's saying? Here they come. Here they come. If you study the Bible in context of the Word of God, they're standing there talking about what this woman had done, and then the Bible lets us know uh, without a shadow of a doubt that here they come, and they're coming what? To hear about Him. Let me ask you a question. Young people, what brought them? Let me tell you what brought them there. Is a woman who Jesus had changed her life. You know what's going to get a lot of people to Christ? It's you living your life and showing people Jesus changed you. Amen. Noah, and I, and I, I use the examples because I did earlier, but I've been in this almost double your age in the ministry. How old are you? Yep. Now, don't you watch this. I know when God changes somebody. I know when it doesn't and they want you to think you did. And I know when they do. Miss Jackie, you knew what Brother Kerry was. And you knew what he was. But when he got saved, he didn't have to wear a t-shirt and say, I'm different. Right? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Can I say this, buddy? When God saved you and changed your life. Right. You know why they were coming? Maybe something like this. Well, man. If it makes that much of a difference in her, I wonder what kind of difference it'd make in me. Amen. Right? Amen. People got the idea that Christians one day we just got up and said we want to try to live better. I tried that. That might last a day. I got too much to preach. Look at verse 35. I want you to see three things. I'm just going to give them to you. I'm not going to, go, I'm not going to preach them. I'm going to give them to you. I may say a little about them. Verse 35, you see the promise of results. Look at it. Say not ye there are yet four months, and then come in harvest. Behold, I say in you, lift your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white in the harvest. I believe when Jesus said that, those men coming over that hill, I believe he was giving them the promise of results. If you go tell people about Christ, it can change, your, it change their lives. Notice verse 36, you see a promise of rewards. And he that reapeth, Receiveth wages and gather fruit into eternal. I want you to know this. When fruit comes in the world, it starts out in infancy, it then goes to maturity, then it rots. You better get it while it's in the way of getting it. 
the promise of rewards, and he that reapeth receive wages. In other words, Jesus said, there's a reward for telling people about him. You know, I believe God let me pastor this good church. I believe without a doubt God has rewarded me, not for because I preach a good outline, not because I live a perfect life, because I know better than that, but I've done my best ever since God called me to do this, to preach him and tell people about Christ, and I believe he honors that. And then he says, verse 36, there's a promise of rejoicing. He that soweth and he that reapeth, rejoice, reapeth may rejoice together. One of these young ladies got saved last week. Where you at? Was it you? Which one got saved last week? Last week, which one of y'all? Get off. You got saved last week. Stand up a second. Tell me your first name again. Christy. Christy. Christy got saved last week. First time you came to Calvary, did Miss Janet bring you? And you got saved. Who led you to the Lord? Who led her to the Lord? Was it you, Miss Janet? Who led her to the Lord? Miss Janet. Janet. Won't you watch this? You know what the Bible's saying in that passage? The Bible said when you, when you sow in people's lives. Miss Janet, did you rejoice when she got saved? Did you rejoice when you got saved? That's living that verse I just said. Right? You know what's fun? You can, you can be seated, Christian. Thank you. You know what's great? When you lead somebody to Christ to tell them about the Lord, besides getting saved, I'm telling you, besides getting saved, it's the best thing ever. Isn't it, Brother James? I, you remember on the mission field in Mexico, seeing somebody get saved, you rejoice as much as they did. I want to say this to you. And thank you, Miss Jessica, for reminding me of this. We were talking about our church today and them joining and all. She, she said, Preacher, do we do, do we do soul winning? I said, Yeah, and talked about operating saturation. We could start on the weather. And I said, Yeah, we do. And you, could just, and you know what? I, I like people that want to go soul winning. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you this the greatest joy of my life apart from being saved is seeing somebody else get saved. Amen. Let's stand our feet. The greatest joy of my life. I'll never forget a boy I led to the Lord up in, up in Robbinsville, North Carolina years ago. I told you about it. I'll never forget. After I cracked a bone in my leg again on a, on a motorcycle and was having to come home and had to be at church the next day and but I'll never forget telling that boy about the Lord and he got saved and he and I were crying. I remember driving all the way, four-hour drive from Robbinsville to my house. And I'll never forget the whole time I'm driving, being as excited as I was this day I got saved. Because I knew that boy didn't have to go to hell. Amen. I have great friends in this world. God's been so good to me. I have people around me I love. But I'm going to tell you this. I just don't want to see anybody die without Christ. Amen. Amen. I don't want to see people die without the Lord. But I want to give a little different invitation today. How many of us are willing to leave our water pot of our own selfishness, of our own desire and go tell somebody about what Christ can do for them? Come see a man. Come see a man. Who does God need you to go say? Maybe not just in words, but the way you live your life. Come see a man. We get so wrapped up in our water pots, our jobs. Got to have them. Our activities, our soccer, our ball, whatever. And we got to have them. We, gotta, we, we don't mind our kids doing those things. We enjoy seeing our kids do those things. But here's the deal. What about the people you love, you care about? If they die, they're going to die without Christ. Young people, knowing all you guys, all these public school kids you know, some of y'all, think about it if, if you guys don't live it in front of them. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to disciple you. Not just get you saved, but we want to get you leaving your water pot of the things that don't really matter and go and let something matter in your life. I wonder this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed. How many of you is a testimony to God's amazing grace? Slip up your hand today and say, Preacher, if I die today, I'm absolutely sure I'd go to heaven. I know I've trusted Christ. I know I've repented. I know I'm saved. How many is a testimony can slip up your hand to that fact today? You can put your hand down. If you're here today and you're not 100% sure of that, if you say, preacher, if I close my eyes today, I'll be told, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven if I died. 
But I want to know that. I want to be sure of it. Would you pray for me? I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm not here to call you out. But I feel burdened in my heart to pray for somebody today. I do. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I'm not 100% sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me? I really want to go to heaven. I want to know. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up right now so I can pray for you? If you need that assurance, you need that help. Could I just pray for you? I'm not coming to you. But I would love to pray for you. I'll let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Could I pray for you? If you couldn't raise your hand, get concerned about your soul. Get concerned about where you're going to spend eternity. Because it matters, friend. It matters. I wonder how many of you right now say, Preacher, I'm saved. No, I'm saved. Don't have any doubt about it. But preacher, I will say this today. Sometimes I need to leave my water pot and I need to let other people know about Jesus in my life. I need to live my life for others a little different, a little better. I, I need to share more about the Lord and tell more people about the Lord. I need my life to be more of a demonstration like this woman was of what Christ has done in my life. I wonder without raising your hand, how many of you some are already doing? Visitor, remember life will slip out of that seat and come and say, I want my life to make a difference in others. When those fields are widened through the harvest and people are coming, I want to know they saw something in my life. They saw something in my life. They saw something in me. And I want them to know that Jesus changed my life. I want to be a better soul winner. I want to be better for the Lord. I want to win more people to God. I want to do more for the Lord, preacher. I really do. I really do. I want my life to count. We have folks here saying, I want my life to count for Jesus. Do you want your life to count for the Lord? Do you want your life to count for the Lord? Friend, I'm telling you, it can. It can. But you've got to let people see Christ in you. Oh, they've got to see Christ in you. Miss Carol, can you come here just a moment? Brother Justin, all it would take when you had those 41 teenagers in Sunday school, all it would take is to have 141, to be honest, is for these young people to get the desire that that woman had when God changed her life. It's to leave the water pots of stuff and go tell somebody about Christ. I'm convinced that churches die when there is no vision. And the world is our vision. We've got to see the world needing Christ.